solve for y, which means you just get one single y on one side by itself, and everything else over on the other side. Um, and when we get into these, a lot of times we'll get different looking answers. Depends on how you want to write it. Um, we'll look at that. Uh, so for 10, or 15x plus 4y equals 9, we're going to have y by itself, which means we're going to have nothing on that side with y. What could we cancel out on the side that y is on so that y is more isolated? 15x. And how do we cancel out that 15x? Subtract it. Subtract that 15x. Uh, so now we have 4y equals 9 minus 15x. And we're almost done. To get y by itself, we just need to do what? So we did divide this whole side by 4, so it could look like this. Okay. Uh, if you're dividing a, a, a sum or a difference by a number or by anything, you could also look at it as dividing each thing by 4. We could write this in whatever order we want to, negative 15x over 4 plus 9 fourths. Lots of different ways this could look. Most common way, probably, we wind up being that way. Why might that be? Does, does this look familiar? Yeah, Brett? Y equals mx plus b. Y equals mx plus b. So I think maybe I can make this x a little more prominent. Y equals mx plus b. So negative, uh, negative 15 fourths for the slope, 9 fourths for the y intercept. because there's more weird variable things, okay? So, what's something we can do to get y more isolated? Add 3x. It's up to you. Do you what you want. You can take tape and like straighten the toe. And no, okay, we don't need, we don't need ideas <laughs> for what Annette can do. Um, she can do what she feels comfortable. Are we just gonna do this and then like review the homework? Uh, yes. Maybe I actually will go. All right. Probably Crunches? Yeah, huh? Do you want me to swap my agenda or? Yeah, sure. No, it's not like it. It's going to see you like hopping. Die in any minute. It's a good Okay, there we are. Back, back focused on this problem. We got a number. We got a number times y. Right? X is a number, represents a number, it behaves just like a number. It divides like a number, it adds like a number, and so on. Okay, so a number times y equals something. Same thing as up here, a number times y equals whatever. So how are we going to get y by itself? That's too fast. <coughs> Divide x. OK, x is cancel. y equals 3x plus 40 over x. Should we cancel out that x? No. Not you cancel out that x because well let's let's say it uh, I think it's been the simplest way that I could say it first. If 
You're going to cancel out x from here. Uh, and from here, you need to cancel it out from every other term. Right? Every term, everywhere, needs to be having an x canceled out in the numerator and denominator. This works, and this works, but this does not have a factor of x. You can't that, uh, cancel out a factor of x from there. As simple as I can say it, and so no, we don't cancel out that x. It's not possible. We leave it alone. It doesn't have a y in it, so that definitely doesn't need to be over here with the y's, so that is helpful. Both of these terms have y in them, and it, we were just running all sorts of different problems. We could try something like subtract 7y from both sides. Now the y's are on different sides, and then it's going to make it hard to isolate. Um, we can't do something like divide by 5x, right, for the same reason we discussed up here. If I was going to cancel out this x, I'd have to cancel out an x here and from here. If I'm going to cancel out a 5x from here and from here, I'd have to cancel 5x from here, which I can't. It doesn't exist. It doesn't have a factor of 5x. Uh, the same reason I can't divide by 7. Well, I could divide by 7, but what I'd wind up getting if I divided by 7 is y plus 5xy over 7, which is not all that better. Okay, so we backed it up again. That, that didn't seem to work. Okay, but we did do a problem like this. Last problem, maybe two like this. Anybody get farther than this? Progress beyond this step at all? Or try something? Subtract 5xy. Okay, subtract 5xy. So we get 7y equals negative 4x minus 5xy. But then, now we have y's on, on both sides, and so, like if we had uh, 2x equals 5 minus 3x, what's the first thing we would do? Divide by 2. What's the first thing you would do? Now well, we got an x over here, so let's collect like terms. Let's put all the x's in the same place. Right. Isn't that what we always do? We collect like terms. We always collect like terms. And then about that time, we divide by the coefficient, and everything is, is peachy. Okay. Well, that really, that this problem is no different, at least in concept. We want to have the same terms together. We want to have the y terms, the terms that we want to solve for. We want to have them together. We don't want to separate them by an equal sign. We want to have them one on the other, you know, one on one side and the other on the other side. So we do have them on the same side, but now what do we do about it? Like there, it's not 2y plus 3y, it's 7y plus 5xy. How do we get a left? Yeah? Divide 5x. Mm -hmm. We actually just talked about that. We tried to divide 5x, and it was the same thing as up here. Right? The same idea. Trying to divide just this 5x out would be the same as trying to cancel out just these x's, which we know we can't do that. All right. Well, let's again look at just this side-by-side -side example. How about if it was 7y plus 2y? Right. This is, we understand this. This is a bit uh, weird. Right? What if it was 7y plus 2y? What would we do with those y's? Why don't we would get? 8, 9y. Well, I'll leave it like that. We just added 7 and 2, and then we multiplied the, that result, right? The sum of those two numbers, we multiplied that by y, right? We all following along on that? 
You take the two coefficients together, you add them together, you multiply that coefficient by y. Okay. Well, we can look at this as, well, obviously this is the coefficient of this y. 7 is the coefficient of this y. We can also group these two together, and they can be the coefficient of y. Right? If I plug the number in for x, like 2, if I plug 2 in for x, I would get 10y, and I would do 7 plus 10 and multiply that by y. If I put 3 in there, I'd have 15. 7 plus 15 is 22, and I have 22y. If I put a four, I, whatever number I put in for x, I would just combine it with 5, and that would be the coefficient. So we could just treat this product as the coefficient. Whatever 5x five, uh, five wound up being, let me just keep, uh, I'll just write this over there. If this were 10, we'd do 7 plus 10. If this were 16, we'd do 7 plus 16 times y. 7 plus whatever this is, we multiply that by y. Agreed? Yeah? If there was a 2, we would do 7 plus 2, that would be 9, 9 times y. This is the exact same thing. 7 plus whatever this is, is the new coefficient for y. When we put those like terms together, that's what it would be. It would work the same. If we put a 2 in there, we would get 10. 7 plus 10 would give us 17. We put a 2 in there. 5 times 2 is 10. 10 plus 7 is 17. You get the same coefficient. Here's another way to look at it. Take this y and distribute it into the parentheses. What do you get? 7y. 7y. Plus 5xy. Plus 5xy. You get the exact same thing. Okay? So we're, we're used to distributing. We, we distribute things all the time. So we're just like going backwards. We're undistributing, or what's the, the real term would be, we're factoring out a y, okay? That's what that's called. So you can just imagine uh, where you have several terms with y in them, and you want to solve for y. You can, you can think of that as like, oh, that's the step after I distributed. So what would it look like just before that? What would it look like before I distributed the y? You just back it up to here. <coughs> Now that we have a coefficient, that's what this is, it's a coefficient times y, just like this problem, and just like this problem, when we had something times y, what did we do at that point? Divide. Divide by that. That works. This is a factor of 7 plus 5x. This is a factor, excuse me, of 7 plus 5x. If we were to plug something in for x, we would get the same number here as we did here cancel each other out. Those are common factors that can cancel each other out. 7 plus 5x on that side. y equals negative 4x over 7 plus 5x. solving an inequality and solving an equation. Yeah. Equations are um, equal while yeah. inequalities are not. And yeah, that is the only difference, right? Equations are equal, inequalities are, well, one side would have to be bigger than the other, right? That's what we have here. This side is bigger than this side. But the process for solving that inequality doesn't look any different from solving an equation. Mm -hmm. Do the same thing to both sides. If we want this side to stay bigger than this side, then we would need to make equal moves on both sides. Otherwise, this will, you know, could possibly become lighter on that side. Okay. So we got to do equal moves on both sides. So what what can we do? What's the first step? Minus, two. Minus what? Minus 2x. Minus 2x. <coughs> Why not minus 9x on both sides? Because it would be negative. It would be negative. It's not, that wouldn't be wrong, but it certainly is nicer to work with positive numbers. 7x plus 4 on this side. I got 18 over here. 4 from both sides. Divide by 7 on both sides. So for this, uh, 9x plus 4 to be larger than 8 plus 2x. x has to be greater than or equal to 2.
now we have, what kind of an inequality is this called? Starts with a C. Compound. It's a compound inequality. This is called an and compound inequality. We have or compound inequality, but uh, right here we have an and compound inequality. Well, there's two inequality signs. How do we handle solving this compound inequality? What's the first thing you do? Subtract four. Okay, subtract four from here. Subtract four from three. From here? What about this? Don't you mean not? Do you? Yeah. You do. And here's here's a way to look at it. Let's let's cross this out. Let's forget about that. So now what we have, we're covering that up. But we just have that inequality. If you were going to solve that inequality, would you subtract four from both sides? Yeah. You would. Okay. Now let's cover this one up. Cover that up. Well, we're covering that one up. Now we're solving this inequality on the right. Would you subtract four from both sides in that case? Yeah. All we're doing is solving both of them at the same time. There's two of them. We would do the same things to this expression. We would subtract four. We would divide by whatever. Like we would follow the same steps in both of the inequalities, and we'd be doing the same thing to both sides of both inequalities. But if we sh if we write it more compactly and we put this just between these two. It's still two inequalities, and we still need to do the same thing to both sides in both inequalities. Okay. So we subtract 4 from both sides. Negative 7 is less than uh, negative x, which is less than or equal to negative 1. Okay. So we we want to get x by itself, right? So how do we get x by itself? Divide by negative 1. Divide by negative 1 divide by negative 1, so we have x, and we have 7, and we have 1. What else are we supposed to do, though, now that we've divided by a negative? Tristan? Switch the uh, signs around. Switch these signs around. So this, where 7 had to be less, now 7 had to be greater. Where uh, negative 1 had to be greater than equal to, it has to be uh, less than or equal to. Okay. So we could, uh, just so it makes a little more sense, write it like this. This feels more natural. Smaller number on the left, large number on the right. This is the same thing, so this, this would be fine too. Okay. So we go back to each of these and we graph the solutions. What does the graph to x is greater than or equal to 2 look like? Number line first, right? Where do we start from there? Zero. Okay, we'll put a zero. How about we'll put a zero right there? Remind ourselves that you don't have to be right in the middle. And maybe a two. Okay, now you're actually gonna have to tell me. Close circle. Close circle on two. How do you know it's close circle on two? Can be equal to. Can be equal to. And to the right. shade to the right. Alright, that'll do it for that one. This one I've got one. Seven, get a zero down here. Okay, uh, at one, what do we do? Close. Close circle, <coughs> seven. Okay. Circle and shade between. X is larger than or equal to one, yeah, that's good. Greater than that. Seven is greater than X, or X is less than seven, right? And so it's squeezing between one and seven. Um, any questions? Anybody has any questions from like 1.4? All those equations work just fine. No problem solving for those. So you're, you're advocating for yourselves here. If you, if you have a question, now we can try to answer. Twenty-eight from one point four.
said 28, right? Yeah. Okay. First thing is a universal for all equations where you want to solve for a particular variable. Variable. You want to solve for a particular variable. The first thing you should try and do is get them all what? Get all those variables. What you try to solve for? Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, collect them. Collect them in one place because they are like terms. If you have, in a, in a sense, they are like terms in the sense that they all have, in this case, they all have a factor of y. So we get x, y minus y is x. And if this were 5y minus y, then we would just subtract those numbers, right? 5y, 5y minus y would be 4y, or 6y minus 2y would be 4y, or 7y minus 9y would be negative 2y. We would just subtract those two coefficients. Or I said, another way to look at it is, hey, this is the step just after I've distributed a y. What would it look like, the step before you distribute this y? I distribute this y into something. And wind up getting x minus y. 1 minus x? 1 minus x? I think that's close. If we do x minus 1, then we get a positive, yeah. So let's uh, just back that up. One little step. <laughs> x minus 1. That way, y times x is xy. y times negative 1 is negative y. And divide by x minus 1. So you're always going to 1. Select like terms on one side. We would always do that with any other situation where the coefficients were simple, like 5x plus 3 minus 2x equals 5 plus 6x minus 3 plus x. When possible, we like to collect like terms, get all those terms in one place together and combine together as, as uh, simply as possible. Right? We would put these together. We would get 3x plus 3 equals 5. We collect, well, that's, uh, that's 2. If we put 5 and negative 3 together, 6x plus x is 7x. And then we collect them on one side together. Okay? We could subtract 7x from both sides. Get negative 4x. Subtract 3 on both sides equals negative 1. And x equals 4. So you always want to collect your like terms on one side, whatever they look like. If you're solving for y and there's a term that has a y in it in any way, shape, or form, get it on one side with the other one. Find like terms, as odd as that might look. This is a coefficient of x, coefficient of negative 1. When we add x and negative 1, we get x minus 1 times y. That's what we, this is what we would do, whatever x was. If x was 5, we do 5 minus 1, and we multiply that by y. We get 4y. So this was 12, we would do 12 minus 1, and then we get 11 times y. So we're just like showing the steps we would take. If those were numbers, if those coefficients were just plain old numbers, what would we do? We'd combine them in that way. We would take x, whatever x was, and subtract 1. And then we multiply that by y. And then we would divide out the coefficient. Same with number coefficients or with variable coefficients, it all works the same way. Okay, or we call this step undistribute. Reverse distribute or whatever. It looks like the same thing. Does that make sense?
make sense? Okay, any questions? So um, today we're going to be writing equations of lines. So we graphed equations of lines, and we're going to write those equations so that can, they can be graphed. And that's going to be a 2.4. Okay, we're going to do it in several different forms. We've got something called the slope-intercept form. Familiar with that? Got a new thing called the point-slope form. And just briefly, the slope-intercept form is called the slope-intercept because it gives the slope and the intercept. Or you would need the slope and the intercept to, to write that equation. Right? You would need that information. Uh, then we have the point-slope form, which to write that equation in that form, you'd need a point, just one point, and the slope. And we'll discuss that in depth, more in depth. Um, and Then we'll talk about direct variation, which is just, uh, it's really just a subset of linear equations. So let's turn to 2.4, and I'm going to bring up some pictures on the screen, and then we'll talk about them. September 17th. The water fountain. The water fountain. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is this number indicating? How many plastic bottles we didn't use because we were using, you know, reusable bottles and refilling them. Okay. That's what that's saying. So what are these two pictures telling us? How much we saved from September 17th. Today, yeah. Okay. So. On September 17th, we, by that date, if you can't read, have saved 2,823 bottles. Oh, is that why that annoying thing kept popping up at the corner of the board? Like, like water bottles? Yes. Um, I wanted to look that one. Yeah, because that would pop up like every day. Like, yeah. So remind me to do this, which I, okay. yeah, I did eventually get that Makes done. Sense. So uh, then by today, we've saved 4,655 bottles. Um, okay, what kind of questions can we ask about having this information? Now that we have it, what can we ask about it? Okay, total number of water bottles saved between those two days. We can do that, we can answer that for sure. Uh, how many? I'm not gonna do the math. What you, what, what, how many bottles have we saved s between these two days? From September 17th. 822. 1,822. Do that in your head? No, 32. Yeah. I'll be impressed. That's. I'm not. I'm that in my head. <laughs> Anybody got a calculator just to double check that? Oh, 
1,832. Let's write a, a coherent sentence here. 1,832 what? What sentence can we say? Water bottle saved. Can we be more specific about those water bottles? Um, From September 17 to October 2nd. Uh, 17 to 10 to. Alright, so there's, there's a question and question answered. How many bottles did we save in that amount of time? What else can we ask? Seventeen until the thirtieth. Count those days up to the thirtieth, which is thirty. Which is thirty minus seventeen. So twelve. Plus. Okay, twelve. That's twelve. Plus another two. Well, it's thirteen days till the end. Thirteen. Yeah. Twelve. Thirteen. So two more. Fifteen days. Yeah. Fifteen days. So 1,832 bottles in 15 days. We just divide those and we, we get something. What do we get? <laughs> bottles per day. And now, hey, can we do this division and find out how many bottles that is? Right, okay, it's probably, but that, in the context, that makes sense, right? Yeah. All right, so, what did we get? 122 bottles per day, and then point one. there. 122.1 bottles? Yes. Point one and it just stops? Oh no, go three repeating after that. One, three repeating? So one, three, 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 okay. Uh, so bottles, Per day. It's a, a lot of bottles every day. Okay. Um, so here's a little, it's kind of an aside. When we take how much one thing has changed and divide it by how much another thing changed, like in the same time, the same context, and we divide them, we get what's called a unit rate. Bottles per day, dollars per hour, miles per second, like all of these things are unit rates. Um, 1,832 bottles for every 15 days is also a rate. But this is called the unit rate. Why is this called the unit rate? This isn't. The unit in, in counting is the number one. And whatever unit we're using down here in the denominator, if we just have one of those units, that's what we call it, the unit rate, the one unit rate. OK. Um, so here's a question that, that I want to ask. Um, so based on this, when should we plan our, let's say, 50,000 bottles saved celebration. What, what date should that be? Based on the information we have here in these pictures. Why don't you uh, work that out a little bit? Work, work for a couple minutes and see if you can come up with something. How can we figure out what day we should have the 50,000 bottles saved November. 
what's over a year and a month from now? When we get 50,000. Okay. How'd you get that? Except we already have like 4,000 yeah. some students. Yeah, so I, I just subtracted that. So then you subtracted. And I divided that by okay. 322. And it was like, like 370 days or something. So you got 370 days from this day or 370 days altogether? 371 from, from today. From, oh, from, from, today, from October 2nd. Basically, yeah. Like that's. Well, I guess how many days from then, how many days from then, or, or what date should it be? It'd be best if you were working on it. How many days will that be till our, what did I say, 20,000? How many days will that be? From today or from, or from September 17th? Oh, right, from September 17th. Well, which one? Which, which one are you, did you today. from today? Yeah, well, it's okay. Um, how about this? How about instead of like doing this cal these calculations over and over, how about if we write uh, a formula? A formula that uh, if you put in, let's say, how many days uh, since September 17th. Let's just start with September 17th. So if you put in the number of days since September 17th, what the formula will tell you is how many bottles are saved. So can you write a formula that will tell you what I just said? A formula that when you put in the number of days, what comes out of the formula is how many bottles we save. Okay. Um, y equals 122.13x X. plus 2,823. Okay. Disagree? What kind of an equation is this? Which would be, if we were to graph it, what kind of shape would it be? A line. 
a line, so that's why we call it a linear function. Okay? It is an mx plus b. So then what is this? That's the slope. Okay. So, and that makes sense because look, what do, what do we do to get 1,832? y2 and y1, this would be x2 and x1. So y2 minus y1 was 1,832. x2 minus x1, in a, in a sense, gave us 15 days with dates that doesn't work out so perfectly. Um, we found the difference in y over the difference in x, and we found the slope. We multiply that slope by x, whatever, how many days go by, that's how we're, we're doing per day, um, plus our y-intercept, our initial value of 28, or 2,823. That's our y-intercept. If we were to graph it, it would be Thousand eight hundred and twenty-three, and then for every day that goes by, we would go up one hundred and twenty-two point one three bottles. Uh, let's see, so that's a thousand. have two points that are on this line, then we can find the slope. Um, and if, if one of those happens to be your initial point, then you have the y-intercept. And then you could just plug that information into your equation. Um, and if we, if we look at this equation, over here, y equals 122.13 x. Um, and we want to know when will we have saved, say, 10,000 bottles of water? Or how many days past September 17th will we have saved 10,000 bottles of water? How would we use this? Equation, this formula to do that. Probably the number 10,000 is going to be part of it. When we have 10,000 for y? 10,000 for y, because y is the output, y is the number of bottles that we have saved. So 10,000 is y equals 122.13 repeating x. That's 2,823. And now the way we solve for x is just what you guys kind of did instinctively. We subtract 2,823 from both sides okay, to find out how many bottles we actually have to save uh, past September 17th. Um, and that's going to be... 7,177. Is that right? Yeah, that's not right. So we know we have to save, please correct me if I'm wrong here, we have to save 7,177 bottles after September 17th to have saved a total of 10,000. We divide all those days by 122.13 bottles a day. Three mil forever, whatever. So X is how many days? Fifty-eight. Fifty-eight 
page? Okay, so approximately, so maybe we should write it down to 58 so we don't miss it. So we could look at the calendar and figure out what 58 days past September 17th is. We should look to see that gauge, dial, or whatever we want to call it, okay, 10,000. That's our prediction. Okay, so it's 58 days past September 17th. We might as well check this out. Dates are, are weird. Some days, some months have 30, some months 31. Yeah. Right? You have to actually count them out. Is that? October has 31 days. Well, if somebody wants to figure that out, it would be nice. It would be fun, I think, to check that out. If we wanted to be more exact, can we use a number besides 122.13? Because that's just November an approximation. What? Or oh, you found November 29th? Yeah. It's 58 days from now? Uh, okay, we can make a note of that. November 29th. From today. You had 58 days to today? Yes. It's November. Uh, it's Tuesday. It's from September 17th, that's what our, oh, our formula is for. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I know that. Tuesday the 12th. Tuesday the 12th of what? November. November. Oh, the 12th of November. Uh, that's a Tuesday. Okay. So I'll try and make a note of that and we'll maybe on November 11th we'll see how close it is. See how good that model was. Is there is there like some while with this formula? Yeah, because you don't know. People could think one day. Yeah, the amount that we use fluctuates. Yeah. Say it's like right. We've got weekends in there. Yeah, do you think any people are filling up the bottle of the weekends? Holidays. Yeah. Well, there were a couple hundred bottles on the dials before school started. Yeah, there was some, during summer, there was some people, you know, for football or whatever that were getting ready for the Janitors. upcoming year. Janitors, me, <coughs> okay. Why were you here? I guess that's where I am. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's that to consider. Um, you know, during the summer, maybe that was even more intense somehow, but I doubt it. Okay. Um, but what we did is we, we took two data points. We got a couple of things out of it. First, we got the slope out of that. And we also uh, assumed this to be our y-intercept. Okay, so if we had the slope and the y-intercept, it would be a pretty easy day. Um, I'm going to go back to my question that I asked just a second ago. Instead of using 122.13, but never being able to write enough threes, can we be more exact? In the slope that we use? Well, where did it come from? Where did that 122 come from? It was a fraction. What fraction was it to start with? So we could write it this way. And it looks more like a, a slope this way. 1832 over 15x uh, plus 2823. So that's all we, we just have two points. Right? Two points, and we can find the equation of a line. So that's one way we can find the equation of a line. <coughs> so without any more, what I think are fun examples of, of real real-world stuff that we interact with each day. Um, let's
let's say we're given the information in a, a little more of a sterile way. Just a point and some other stuff. Um, Like for 31, we're given the point 4, negative 1, and 6, negative 7. Okay, so on day 4, we've saved negative 1 bottles, on day 6, we've saved negative 7 bottles, or something weird like that. Right? It's just two data points. It's X stands for something, Y stands for something. Okay? If we want to be able to write this equation y equals mx plus p. <coughs> what do we need to find? Slope. We need to find the slope. Can we find the slope? Mm -hmm. How do we find the slope? Y2 minus y1 over x2 minus That's right. Negative 7 minus negative 1 over 6 minus 4. So that'll be negative 6 over 2, two negative 3. So the slope is negative How do we find that y-intercept? Right, Bob? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. uh, we could use the point slope form. But if we didn't know about the point slope form, what might we do? Find the point where the line goes over the line. Right? And how would we do that? Graph, I don't see. If, if you were a person on the test who said, oh, they're perpendicular because I drew them and they look perpendicular, you got credit. Because, not because I'm mean, but because I was, for one, very specific about what I wanted. And also, that's not enough, right? I don't mean to put you down if you rate you or anything, but when we graph things, that's not enough. Even if you're the best graph drawers in the world, if it lands in between two data points, we can't know for sure. Can you plug a point in with the slope to So we can plug the slope in there. Mm -hmm. And what do you mean plug a point in? How would we do that? Uh, one of these? No, I'll pick this one. How do we plug it in? The y and the x. Y and the y and the x and the x. Okay. So we'll bring those down. We'll put the y there. We'll put the x there. So negative 1 equals negative 3 times 4 plus b. So that's what this equation of this line tells you. If you give it an x, it should tell you the y. And we know an x and a y, and we can plug those in. So negative 1 equals negative 12 plus b. So b equals 11. And if we add 12 to both sides. So to finish this out, we only need the slope and the y-intercept, which we have both now, and y equals negative 3x plus 11. There is also this thing called the point slope form. This other form of a line. There's lots of forms of equations of lines. You get the point, you get the slope intercept form. We talked about standard form. Kind of a silly thing, but there it is nonetheless. And now we've got this thing called the point slope form. Okay. Because instead of plugging in a point and a slope this way and then solving for b, you can use a point slope form, which is y minus y1 m times x minus x minus x. Now this y is the y. It is the y in your equation. When you get done and it says y equals mx plus b, that's the y we're talking about, the variable y. But this y is a specific y. Right? A y, a number that, that actually represents a y that's uh, a point on a line. And say for this x1, it's a, an x from a point on the line. So you can write y minus Use the same one. Y minus 4 equals the slope, negative 3 that we already found, times x minus, uh, I messed that up, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Minus negative 1. Negative 1 and 4. And then we can stop there. That really is an equation of a line. It's not a point, uh, not in slope intercept form. So we could write it that way. Distribute that negative 3. y equals 
negative 3x plus 100. We did it again. So if we're given two points, that's enough information. If it's enough information to draw the line, is enough information to find the equation of it. Two points, find the slope, and you can plug it into the slope intercept, solve for b, plug b back in, or use point slope form, and uh, solve for y, and then you're done. Um, To write the equation of a line, let's just kind of write over to the side here for a second. To write, write the equation of a line, um, or the same question, to draw a line, how much information do you need? Two points. That's really what it comes down to, two points. If you have two points, you should be able to do that. But maybe they don't give you this point and that point. They give you maybe a point and something else. Uh, if I were to say, hey, there's a point right here, that point is on the line, what other information could I give you that like, helps you define the next point? Slope. slope. If I give you the slope, we could draw this line. Yeah, you can count it off, you can make another point. So two points, point and a slope will work. That should be enough information. And those are the two main combinations of information that they give you. They're going to give you two points explicitly, or they're going to give you a point of some kind, and a, a slope, or a way to find the slope, or something like that. Okay. Well, are they giving us two points here? They're just saying, here's a point, here's another point. No, mm -hmm. clearly not. Okay. They're giving us a point, and so they must be giving us information about what else? The line. The what? The line. The line, this line? Yeah. Information about this. So what does this line tell us um, about our line? They have the same slope. They have the same slope because? They're parallel. Because they're parallel. That means they have the same slope. So what is the slope of this line? Then? Negative 4. Negative 4. And is equal to negative 4 here. So the slope here must also be Well, we got a point, we got a slope, and so we might as well use the point slope for That's, again, y minus yy equals m times x minus x1. So y minus 5 equals m, which is negative 4, times x minus negative 3. x minus 12, which is a positive 3, multiplied by negative 4, uh, and plus 5, add 5 to both sides. Negative 4, x minus the slope, you can use a point slope form. You could find the slope and you could plug a point and the slope into the slope intercept form, find B and plug B back in. Uh, if they give you the point and a slope, you could just go right to the point slope form. If they just told you that the point is negative 3, 5 and the slope is negative 4, you can plug that all into the point slope form and solve for Y. Again, you could plug it into the slope intercept form and solve for B and plug B back in. Um, and they don't tell you the, par the, the, uh, the slope right off, then they're going to have to tell you some way to find the slope. It's parallel <coughs> to the line, it's perpendicular to the line. 
is on our line, and what else can you tell me about this line? What else can we say about that line? Negative three, because this slope is one third, this line is perpendicular, what does that mean about its slope? Reciprocal. So negative 3 over 1, negative 3. So point, slope, point, slope, point. y minus 1 equals m times x minus x1. y equals negative 3x plus 12. Add 1 to both sides. y equals negative 3x plus 13. Plug that into the slope intercept form itself. Um, so, how about if you do number twenty five? So what other information are we going to get about this line? Are we going to get a second point to find that out? Yes or no, or are we going to just find another point out there somewhere? No. no. We're going to use this to find it. What are we going to find out about? Slope. 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 How are we going to find out about the slope? Because it has to be perpendicular. So. so this line has to be perpendicular to this line, and we know there's a connection between perpendicular lines and their slopes, which is opposite reciprocal. Cool. Yeah. So, what's the slope of this line? Negative one over four. No, this line. Four. Oh, four. Four. So the slope of this line is negative one over, negative one over four. four. Okay. Let's do it the slope-intercept way. We'll we'll solve for b. Okay. So we plug negative one in for y equals m x plus b, which we don't know yet. We're trying to find that. Negative one equals negative three fourths plus b. We'll add 3 fourths to both sides. Add 3 fourths to both sides. Negative 1 fourth equals b. Alright? So y equals mx plus b plus a negative 1 fourth. <coughs> Questions about that? Let's say for y equals mx plus b, if b equals 0, then y uh, varies 
directly with x. Which really means like this equation will look like y equals just mx. So we're looking at y equals mx. y equals just a number times x. We're looking at direct variation. Right. It's simple. X gets multiplied by a number, and that gives you Y. Nothing else. As X goes up, Y goes up um, just by a, a portion of X. <coughs> okay. um, what will the graph of this look like? What, what will all the graphs of direct variations have in common? Point at zero, zero. The point is zero, zero. They will go through the origin. The Y intercept will be zero. That's, that's what we said, B, the y-intercept will be zero. Okay, so a point right there at zero, zero. All direct variation graphs go. This is mostly useful in vocabulary. You're going to have um, people possibly say in a problem that something varies directly with something else. Okay? So just to say it another way, if y varies directly with x, we would just say y equals something times x. y is just equal to a constant times x. This is called the constant of variation. So really what we have is, is a bunch of fairly simple equations of lines that just go through the origin uh, if you were to graph them. But what if They give us this data and they say, does y vary directly with x? Keep in mind, if y varies directly with x, this is all it means. This is the exact definition of y varies directly with x, or a varies directly with b, or k varies directly with w, whatever. So given this data here, how can we determine whether y varies directly with x? Take x, what's that? Suggestion? I'm pretty sure it is because That's exactly it. If we can take every x and multiply it by the same number, then we oh, have direct so that variation. Would be a. That would be a. Yeah, negative 4 would be a. So, as you said, you multiply everything by negative 4 to get from x to y. If you can do that to get from every x to every y so by the same number, then this just has to be like the same multiple, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But it has to be the same every time, right? It wouldn't make sense that this would be uh, times negative 4 and this was times 7. Right? Yeah. You've got to do the same thing. How did you figure that out? How did you figure out it was negative 4? Just I just looked at that. What would you have to multiply? 
fly by. Yeah. Right. Um, so, but that, that's that's division, right? If we want to figure out what uh, we have to multiply by, what we have to multiply negative five by to get twenty, we would take twenty and divide it by negative five, and that would give you negative four. So we divide twenty by negative five, and we get negative four. Then we should get the same thing every time we divide. So we do it that way. Divide by that, this divide by that, this divide by that, this divide by that. Okay. So if y equals ax, then a equals y over x. The only way we can verify that we have direct variation going on there. Okay. So I tell you that x equals negative 3 and y equals negative 5. I say y varies directly with x. The one thing, what does that mean, y varies directly with x? What's the definition of y varies directly with x? If x changes, y also has to change. Well, lots of things are that way. x changes and y changes. That's the basis of all functions, right? It's about how it changes. It's about the, what kind of equation relates the two things. What does the equation look like that relates these two things? Y equals ax. Y equals ax. Y equals something times x. So if we wanted the equation that relates all y's and x's, if this is a, if this is a particular y and an x, how do we find that equation? How do we find out basically how do we find out A? Negative five divided by negative three. Yeah. If y equals ax, then negative five equals a times negative three. So negative five divided by negative three equals a. Which is positive five thirds. So y equals five thirds times x. <coughs> If you think about it, if it's direct variation, <clears throat> then on the graph, what do all the graphs have me on? Zero, zero. They all go through here, right? All going to go through there. So if I give you a point somewhere on the graph where this thing goes through, whether it's uh, here, or let's say it's on the same line here, or there, or there right? they're all going to be on the same line. If I give you that point, then that y divided by that x will always be the slope for that line. Because it'll always go up this much and over this much. Up this much and over that much. Up this much and over that much. And since it doesn't matter how far away that point is, it's, they're still going to go up and over by the same ratio. The rise of the run is going to be the same at all points. So for direct variation, if you just take a point that's on uh, the line of the direct variation equation, take y divided by x, that's just going to be the slope. There's no y-intercept to adjust for. It's just at zero. Any questions?